Hello, my name is Catherine and I just graduated from BC Berkeley and I'll be joining Stanford as a PhD student in the fall. In this study, my co-authors and I focused on examining the privacy and security behaviors of Android applications that come both free and paid versions in the Google Play Store. We paired a user study to understand consumer expectations of free and paid apps with real world dynamic app analysis to learn if the behaviors of apps found in the wild actually do conform to these user expectations. We first became interested in this problem because mainstream media has often uncritically reported that users should expect privacy invasive behavior to be paying for otherwise allegedly free services. In other words, users have been repeatedly told that if they aren't paying for the product, then they themselves should be part of the product. In response, experts have even stated that a viable alternative to this privacy invasive behavior would be the pay for privacy model. In other words, users should expect to be able to pay an upfront cost or adhere to some subscription model in order to avoid any privacy invasive behavior. So we wanted to understand, do real users actually believe that they can viably pay for privacy today? So we developed a consumer expectation survey and we recruited 998 participants through Prolific. Our sample was roughly gender balanced where 52% of our sample self-identified as female and the median age was 34 and the age range was anywhere from 18 to 76. We began our survey by asking participants what app they would be most likely to install on their hypothetical device. And the options we gave them were um, scraped from the Google Play Store's top free applications, including apps like Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, Pandora, among others. Once users selected the app that was most desirable or relevant to them, we then presented a series of mockups. First, we presented the original Google Play Store listing of the app they selected. In this case, we have the example for Facebook. And then below it, we presented the ad-free hypothetical version. So in addition to the 99 cent buy button being a major difference, other differences were the word ad free included in the app title and the removal of the contain ads tag um, from the listing. Contains ads is a tag used in the Google Play Store to notate when an app uh, should have ads or not. So once users were presented with these mockups, we began a series of questions that were open-ended, multiple choice, and five-point Likert scale questions. So first, we wanted to understand the consumer purchasing preferences between the applications. And we found that 39% of our participants stated that they would prefer to download the paid version of the app instead of the free one. And when prompted to ask for why they would make these decisions, the most common response for preferring the paid version was for the removal of ads. Other reasons included the expectation for better features or functionality or better performance of the application. When asked for differences between the two versions, 86% of participants cited ad-free as the main difference between the free and paid version. This is unsurprising though, because ad-free was explicitly a difference between the mockups that we presented in the previous slide. But what we really wanted to understand was that if participants are actually construing the word ad free to then be a proxy for better security and privacy behaviors in the paid version. So we decided to straight up ask them. We asked if users believed that there would be a difference in the treatment of their personal data between the two versions. And we found that 29% of participants stated that they did believe that there was a difference. And of these participants, we found that 46% of them mentioned tracking, and 57% of them mentioned targeting for advertisements explicitly. For example, one such user stated that if they're paying for an application that is removing ads, because they don't expect to see ads, they don't think that the ad application itself would have any use for the personal data because the app itself isn't trying to sell them anything. Meaning that users are then equating the visual absence of ads with better security and privacy. So then we followed up with a series of Likert scale questions prompting to uh, the privacy and security behaviors and asking which behaviors they expected were more likely of the free or the paid version. So users were more likely to expect the paid versions of apps to have effective privacy controls, meaning that users had better 
um, agency over the granularity of their privacy settings, um, that the paid versions of apps would no longer retain data after uninstallation, meaning they had just better data retention practices, um, that the paid versions would better protect the data. It was given legitimate permission to access through the Android permission system. Um, to the paid versions would better comply with privacy laws and regulations such as CCPA, COPPA, and GDPR. To, they also expected the paid versions of apps to be more transparent about data collection and sharing practices, namely in the privacy policy disclosures. And they also expected the paid versions of apps to better collect and store user data securely, meaning that they expected the paid versions of apps to encrypt data in transit and encrypt data at rest. On the flip side, users were more likely to expect free applications to share their data with advertisers, to share their data with third-party services, meaning um, other parties outside of the main application, to use user data for secondary purposes. So that would be any purpose that is outside of the core functionality of the app, namely advertising. Uh, they also expected free apps to access more resources than necessary. Uh, they expected free apps to retain data longer than necessary, AKA have worse data retention practices and they expected free apps to be more willing to share data with law enforcement agencies. So we also noted that there were particularly large effect sizes associated with the sharing of data with third party services and the use of user data for secondary purposes. So while only 29% of participants um, stated that they expected a difference in the treatment of user data when asked in an open-ended question, um, users were consistently expecting better privacy and security behaviors of paid versions of apps, um, according to our five-point Likert scale questions. So we wanted to know if real-world applications found in the Google Play Store are actually meeting consumer expectations of being able to then pay for privacy. So as far as the corpus goes for the apps that we analyzed, we boiled it down to just under 6,000 pairs of free and paid Android apps from the Google Play Store. So in order to actually construct our corpus, we scraped the Google Play Store for the top free applications. And we looked in particular for the free applications that had the word light or free in their package name because that then implied that there was a paid or premium counterpart. So then we used an Amazon Mechanical Turk labeling task to sort through all of the paid applications from the same developer of the free version of the app to find a one-to-one -one correspondence of the intended paid version of a given free application. We had to go about this in a sort of roundabout way because the Google Play Store doesn't currently have any metadata or other information linking together free and paid intended counterparts. So as far as the different metrics that we looked at for analysis, we started off by looking at the different dangerous permissions declared. So dangerous permissions are a subset of the Android permission system that safeguard access to sensitive resources that particularly have to do with user private information or user stored data. We looked at the dangerous permissions in particular because we believe that they best um, had the most relevance to user security and privacy. We also took a look at the different third-party packages included in the app. So these different third-party packages um, are a way for app developers to streamline the app development process and use existing libraries to implement different functionalities, um, use for graphics libraries, analytics, and in particular interest to us, advertising. We also took a look at, at the different domains that receive sensitive data. So these are going to be remote destinations that are receiving personally identifiable information, or PII, uh, persistent identifiers that are used for user tracking. So this sensitive data is going to be uh, different data types such as the Android Advertising ID, which is a technically resettable identifier, uh, the Android ID itself, which is a non-resettable persistent identifier, uh, location information, among a bunch of other things. We also took a look finally at the content of the privacy policies. Uh, privacy policy links are have a designated area in the Google Play Store listing, so we want to see if there were any differences between the privacy policies of a given pair. As far as our methodology goes, for the network data transmissions, we wanted to ensure that we were downloading the free and paid versions of the applications at the same time on two identical Nexus 5X phones. We then used something called the Android Exerciser Monkey, which is an Android app UI fuzzer, to generate a sequence of inputs. 
these taps and swipes were then fed into the free and paid version at the same time. By controlling for the same input sequence, we were attempting to have a best effort approach at controlling for observed differences in behavior between the free and the paid versions. However, we acknowledge that this doesn't account for any UI differences that are actually there between the free and paid versions of the apps. We also want to note that because we're using a UI fuzzer that's simply randomly tapping and swiping across the phone screen, um, all of our results, especially for the network transmissions, are simply a lower bound because the UI fuzzer doesn't execute all of the code paths possible in the application. So just because some observation didn't make it into our network transmissions observations, that doesn't mean that that type of data transmission would never happen in practice. So overwhelmingly, what we found is that consumer expectations are not being met in practice. And let's take a look. So for the dangerous permissions, we found that there were 2,887 pairs in our corpus in which the free version declares at least one dangerous permission. This graph shows that 74% of the time, the paid version has all of the same dangerous permissions declared in the uh, paid version as the free version. In 10% of the time, the paid versions of the applications have some of the same dangerous permissions declared. And in 16% of the time, the paid versions have none of the same dangerous permissions declared in the free version. So this isn't that surprising because the dangerous permissions also have legitimate use. But what's interesting to note here is that 16% of the time, since the free version um, includes dangerous permissions that the paid version doesn't, it hints at the over-permissioning that might be occurring. Since if the paid version doesn't have it, these permissions were definitely not necessary for the core function of the application. Let's take a look at an example here. So this is Zombie Avengers Stickman War Z. We'll be picking on this app a little bit throughout the presentation because we found that this is the paid version, but across all of the metrics we looked at, it really didn't have any difference at all um, with its free version. So here we see that uh, this app declares both access to user course and find location data. So for the third party packages, we found that there were 5,680 pairs in which the free version included at least one third party package bundled into the APK. And we found that 45% of the time, the paid versions had all of the same third-party packages. However, this doesn't tell us much because, as we mentioned before, third-party packages is a large overarching category that can service a lot of different needs. So we wanted to look at the third-party packages that would best serve as a proxy for user security and privacy. So in order to do that, we had to actually categorize the different third-party libraries. So to do this, we determined our categories using existing research. So based upon Liberator's categories, we were able to find known advertising libraries. So according to Liberator, we were able to find advertising libraries in 50% of our free apps, um, which is unsurprising. But surprisingly, we were able to find advertising libraries in 25% of our paid apps. And even worse, we found that 22% of the pairs shared at least one ad library, meaning that the same ad library was included in both the free and paid versions. But worst of all, we found that 4% of the paid apps actually introduced a new ad library, meaning an ad library was present in the paid version that was never included in the free version, meaning that users could even be exposed to more privacy invasive behavior in the paid version of the application. One thing to note here, though, is that Liberator struggles with deobfuscation, and because many third-party libraries are obfuscated when they are bundled into the application, um, all of these results are going to be all of the ones that we're able to find with Liberator, but we acknowledge that there might be some that slip through the cracks. By and large, we found that Google Ads was the most prevalent ad library present in 45% of the apps in our corpus, and it was followed by a long tail of other ad libraries. The next runner-ups include Unity, Mopub, and Chartboost, each of which were present in 4% of our corpus. So let's circle back to Zombie Avengers again, and we find that there was um, advertising libraries tagged by uh, LibRadar for sponsor pay, Unity ads, and Bungle in this application. And this is the paid version, mind you. And it's interesting to note that for Zombie Avengers in the description, it notes that one of the many privileges for this app are that there are no advertisements present, even though even the Google Play Store says that it contains ads. So 
we acknowledge that, you know, just because an ad library is included in the application, how do you know uh, whether that ad library code is actually being run and if those advertisements are actually being served or if user data is actually being transmitted to these advertising companies. So we had to take a look at the actual destinations that are receiving the sensitive data. So we found just under 1600 pairs in which the free version was found to have um, any active transmission of user sensitive data. And we found that in 50% of the time, paying for an application really is going to remove all of those sensitive data transmissions. But that doesn't explain the fact that the other half the time, um, some, if not all of the same, sensitive data transmissions are going to occur. So this really represents that 50-50 mercy shot that consumers have in knowing whether paying for an application is actually going to uh, protect their data in any way. So for Zombie Avengers in particular, we found that even though we have the privilege of no advertisements, allegedly, the Android Advertising ID and the Android ID, both persistent, both persistent identifiers used for user tracking and uh, advertisement targeting, were being transmitted to parties like Bungle, Unity, Facebook, and Chartfruits. So finally, looking at the privacy policies, we found that we were only able to access the privacy policies of 55% of the apps in our corpus. Um, the most common reason being that most of the time that we just weren't able to find a link in the Google Play Store for a privacy policy. And uh, other issues that we ran across were that the links ended up leading us to bogus documents or that the links themselves led us to error pages. Of the, uh, of the privacy policies that we were actually able to analyze, we found that 3.7% of them listed behavior differences between the versions. And these included differences like the list of third parties that were getting data, um, how much data were being shared to these third parties, how much data was being collected in general, and um, the level of access for users' permissions. This is already problematic in and of itself because the Google Play Store's own policies note that if the app is dealing with user-sensitive information, then the apps must list a privacy policy in the Google Play Store listing. In addition to that, it's also violating uh, legislation such as GDPR or CCPA that mandate that users should have um, proper privacy policies or disclosures about their data. So overall, we found that while users consistently had better expectations of security and privacy um, in paid versions of applications, we found that the expectations were not being met in practice. Instead, we found that the measurable privacy benefits of paying for an application are murky and wholly unclear. This is particularly evident in our observations of the active net network transmissions of sensitive user data, where paying for an application only removes the active data collection and half of the paid counterparts. Not only this, but the lack of transparency found in the Google Play Store, and with the inaccessibility of already notoriously verbose privacy policies, Users are left in the dark and are ultimately unable to make informed purchasing decisions with respect to their own privacy and security. So after all this, it seems that all of the assumptions around the pay for privacy model as something as a viable alternative for users is wholly misleading because it turns out that even when users are paying for the product, they might still be a part of the product. Thank you. <laughs>